Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Nicole Wilde. And I'm Laura Burheny. Congratulations on choosing to train your pooch. You know, dog training has changed a lot in the last 20 years. It used to be based on force and intimidation. Now, fortunately, we have much more gentle, positive methods. That means you can start training your puppy as young as seven weeks of age. And even if you have an old guy like Harley here at home, it's never too late to start. With the methods we use, we don't punish the dog for making mistakes. We set them up to succeed, then reward them for doing the right thing. There's a big difference between using rewards for training and bribery. An example would be calling the dog to you, then rewarding him for coming, versus dangling a piece of food and saying, if you come to me, I'll give you this. That's bribery. But if you call the dog to you and then present the food and reward him, that's a reward. Now, if you've ever seen a trained dolphin show, you've actually seen the results that positive, gentle training can achieve. Yep, it's pretty tough to intimidate a dolphin. And they don't make choke chains for dolphins because they don't have a neck that would slide right <laughs> off. So true. But the methods we use are the same methods used in training animals for films. Now, just because we're using gentle, positive methods, that should not be confused with being permissive with your dog. Just like we set rules and boundaries for our kids, we do the same things for our dogs. So think of us as your private in-home trainers. We'll be taking you step by step through how to train basic behaviors. We'll offer solutions to common behavior problems and much, much more. So sit back, grab your remote, and let's get started. This is McKinley. He's a Malamute, and we're going to be teaching McKinley to SIT. The way I'm doing this is I'm luring him over the head. Yes, good boy. I'm not saying the word yet, SIT, and the reason is, yes, McKinley doesn't know what it means. I'd be sitting here yelling, sit, 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 and we don't want to get into that habit. Yes. What I am saying is, yes, as soon as his cute, handsome butt hits the floor, the reason I'm doing that is to let him know the exact moment, yes, that he's doing what I want him to do. I'm then rewarding him with a treat. Yes. Yes, very good puppy. What I'm doing is moving the treat over his head. Yes. Hey, you're here, beautiful. McKinley. Sit. Very good. He was doing advanced tricks. That was a spin. I'm also using lots of praise and petting, too. I've started adding the word in because now I feel pretty sure that he's going to do it. Sit. Very good boy. I'm now turning this into a hand signal. Sit. Very, very nice. Sit. Very good puppy. Yay! Good boy. All done. This is Toby, and today we're going to be teaching Toby how to sit. So what I'm doing is taking the treat. I'm going to lure him with the food over the head. Yes! I'm using yes to mark the moment that his tush hits the floor, so to let him know what it is he's done that I like. Then I'm rewarding him with a food treat and lots of praise. If he jumps up, that's OK. Yes! He'll get the idea. Be patient. Puppies can be very rambunctious. I'm also not going to reward her unless her paws are on the floor and her butt's on the floor. Now, you've got to be careful. If you have a very energetic puppy, like some labs, you don't want to use too much. <laughs> now, that's a down. That's advanced. You don't want to use too much of a happy, excitable praise voice because you, the dog can get out of control and start jumping up. So, sit. Yes. I'm also giving lots of praise rather than just shoving treats at her. Because using the treats and the praise together is going to make the praise more valuable. Sit. Yes, very good. Now I'm adding the cue word sit in because I know she's going to do what I'm asking. Sit. Very good. Should we try it with the cue word? Sit. Yes, very good puppy. Now I'm going to be using a hand signal here. Sit. Very nice. Sit. Excellent puppy, yes. So Toby is picking up on this hand signal. Sit very, very quickly. You're doing very well. Puppy's obviously suffering from excessive cuteness. Sit very good. And sit very nice. And sit very good puppy, yes. Sit excellent, very good puppy.
you're going to teach McKinley here how to lay down. And the way I'm going to do it is by using a process called shaping. With shaping, what we do is we reward little bits of the behavior instead of expecting the dog to do the whole thing. That was very good. I got a little paw there. A little more. A little further down. Yes, very good boy. That's excellent. Let's try that again. Again, hey, Sit. Very good boy. A little bit. Good. A little more. A little further down. Yes, very good boy. That's excellent. Now let's see if we can lure you all the way down in one swell foop. Ready? Here we go. Yes, what a good boy. That was excellent. Lots of verbal praise along with the treats. Let's get you back in a sit. Very good boy. Now that he's starting to follow my hand down, I'm going to have the treat in my hand this way so that it turns into a little bit more of a hand signal. Very nice. Very good boy, McKinley. Let's try that again. Very good. Ready? And I'm going to add the word because he's doing so well. Down. Very nice. Down. Excellent puppy. I'm going to give him an extra one just for staying there because I don't want you guys to have the kind of dogs that pop right up out of a down. Ready? Good boy. Sit. Because he's doing so well, I'm now going to fake him out. We're going to pretend I have a treat here, but I really don't. Ready? Down. Yes, and I'm rewarding him from the other hand. That was very, very good. That's a jackpot. That was excellent. and he's a corgi and we're going to teach him down using a step because he has a much longer nose than he has legs. If we were on a flat surface he would just stand here sniffing the food. Good for you. We're going to use the step and lower the food lower than the level that he's standing on which pretty much forces him to go into a down. And as soon as he does go down I'm going to open up my hand and let him have some cookies. We want you to understand that you won't have to use food in training forever. It's just a means to an end. The reason we use food is because every dog likes it Every dog needs it to survive. By using food, you're requiring them to work for something that they need to survive on. And also, by using food, we can use little tiny pieces that are easy for them to chew, and that way we get a whole bunch of repetitions in. If we get a lot of repetitions in, all that means is that we're making the behavior stronger. Right, Laura. You can also put food rewards on a variable schedule. At first, we're rewarding the dog every time for doing the right thing. After the dog really knows the behavior, you can do two things. One is you can introduce alternate rewards besides the food treat, which could be a pet. Um, it depends what's valuable to your dog. It can be a little quick game of tug. Or you can start rewarding every couple of times. Don't do it too predictably. For example, if you gave him a food treat every second time, your dog would quickly come to learn the pattern. So do be unpredictable. If you've ever played the slot machines at Vegas, you've been a victim of variable reinforcement ratios. And all that means is that you keep playing because you might win. Yep, and it sure keeps you going because you're afraid to leave for fear that that next pull that somebody else does is going to be the jackpot. Stay. Very good. Excellent. In working on the stay, the things that you want to remember are, number one, to keep your voice nice and calm when you praise the dog. Good stay. If you say, good stay, you might get the dog up, and that's not what we want to do here. Very good. You can practice stays with your dog in a sit position or in a down. A good time to practice stays is when your dog is tired out. That way they're more likely to stay and not want to get up. Now, I always want to set the dog up to succeed, so what I'm doing here is breaking this into very, very small pieces, breaking the behavior down into small steps that the dog can easily achieve. In other words, I'm not putting Sonny on a stay here and running out for coffee and expecting him to be here when I get back. Stay. Good. My face looks happy and relaxed. I'm not all frowny saying, good stay. It's a very good, happy stay. And now I'm taking a whole step back. I am, however, with my body still sort of suppressing Sonny here by leaning forward. Very good dog. I'm being very sure to go all the way back to Sunny with the treat so that Sunny doesn't have to get up and come toward me. And if you notice, my voice is very calm and even. Even when my praise voice comes out, it's not a happy, excited voice.
could stay. It's very even and it's designed to keep the dog in place. Now, the way I would progress with this exercise, good stay. Lots of verbal feedback, just a little bit at a time, good. Now, the truth of the matter is, in real life, most of us don't walk around like this backwards. So, I also like to throw in at the beginning of a stay, just when you're right next to the dog, turning a little bit with your back, and then coming back and rewarding. Very nice stay. We also, I want to point out, are rewarding the dog during the stay, rather than the way it used to be trained, which was to have the dog sit and stay and then call the dog to you and then reward. If you call the dog to you and then give them a treat, what you're actually rewarding is the dog running to you, not the dog staying there. So it's very important to keep rewarding during the stay. Very good. A few other things that you can add in, once the dog is doing this really nicely, which Sunny is doing pretty well, I might say, is you can just move a little, little bit, okay? Yeah, we can be silly, we don't mind, do we? Very good, stay. You can have your arms moving around. You can go back and forth. Yeah, the trainer's silly, isn't she? Very good. Good stay. You can eventually work up to having people walk by very slowly at first and then more quickly. If you have children in the family, you can get them involved too by having the dog stay and have the kids walk by, then progress to running by, flailing their arms and being as silly as they'd like to be. That way everybody enjoys the training. Very good. At the end of the stay, you want to use a release word, like, all done. If you have a dog who gets up and walks away while you're trying to teach them to stay, you can do what I've done here and put a leash on them and simply put the leash under your foot so the dog doesn't have the choice of leaving. Sunny, sit. I'm going to put Sunny back in position and down. Very good boy. And stay. Very, very nice. And we're going to be showing a couple of things with him. One is, Augie, here. Good boy. How to proof his stay using a toy instead of food. Down. What we're going to do is I have his favorite toy in the world, which is a tennis ball. And I put him in a down, which he already knows. And then I'm going to raise my arm as if I'm going to throw the ball. And if he were to get up, I would drop my arm and not throw the ball. Because the reward for staying is actually throwing the ball. So I'm going to fake throw it. Ready? You stay. Good. Uh oh, bummer. Oh, come here. You blew it. Good. Lie down. So I didn't actually throw the ball because he got up. So we're going to do that again. Excellent. You stay. Uh oh, no. But he's getting better because he's not going as far. Stay. I can also set him up to succeed by not throwing, not fake throwing as hard. I can just maybe go half a throw, he doesn't move, and then I can give him the ball. Good boy, good, yes. I know, give me the ball. Good, excellent, good, come here. Good, down. And again, the reward for not moving is giving him the ball. Down, you cheated. Stay. Yes, get it. Excellent ball. I know, oh, and that bark that you just heard was a pushy, obnoxious bark saying, throw the ball, throw the ball. He's trying to force me to play with him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the ball and put him in like a 10-second timeout. I'm not going to throw the ball for him because he tried to push me into doing it. You ready? Stay. Uh-oh. -uh. That was excellent. He almost self-corrected that time. Stay. Yes, get it. Good boy. Very nice. Good. Stay. Uh, down. Good. Stay. Yes, get it. Excellent. Now watch. If I leave the ball here on the ground, he's going to bark. And as soon as he barks, I'm going to pick up the ball, and I'm not going to give it to him. His barking is going to be telling me, pick up the ball, throw it, hurry up, hurry up. What are you, stupid? Good. And since he's not, since he's making a lie about him, uh-oh, that's a bummer. That's too bad. So I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to make him wait an extra 10 seconds. And now I'm going to give it to him for being quiet. Good boy. Kale, stay. Good, stay. Excellent. The reason we're doing stay here with Kale on a step is because there's more of a discrimination for a dog being up on a platform or a stair than there is simply getting up from the floor and moving. Kale, stay. 
Good stay. Excellent. Very nice stay. I'm keeping my voice very low and even, just like with any other stay, using the hand signal. Good boy. Good stay. And I'm starting to build a little bit of distance here with him as well. Good dog staying. Going all the way to him with the treat so he doesn't feel that he has to get up. Stay. Good stay. And reward him always for doing the right thing. One of the most important things you can teach your dog is to come when called. Some people call it the recall. And the simplest way to start training that is to make use of your dog's natural instinct to chase things that move. In this case, you're going to be the thing that's moving. So start out with him here, make sure you've got his attention, then call his name, Fido come, at the same time as you're running a few steps away from him, patting your leg to encourage him to come along with you. And reward him by giving him a treat and by petting him and telling him what a good dog he is. Yes, good boy. Ready? He'll come. Very good boy. And watch me, watch me. Ready? Ready? He'll come. Very good boy coming with me. Very good. This time, instead of giving him the treat when he comes running with me, I'm actually going to toss it so I can create a little bit of distance between myself and Kale. That way I can call him to me. Ready? He'll come. Very good. Go get it. Okay, ready? He'll come. Good boy. He'll come. He'll come. Yay! Very good. And I'm tossing it again and moving in the opposite direction. He'll come. Very good boy. He'll come. He'll come. Yay! That was excellent. What a good puppy. He'll come. He'll come. He'll come. He'll come. Yay! He'll come. He'll come. Good. Go get it. He'll come. He'll come. And go get it. Good boy. He'll come. He'll come. Go get it. Kill come. Kill come. Yay. Come on. Good boy, Kill. Yay. In the training exercise where you started out standing by your dog, running away, patting your leg, and saying whatever the dog's name is, come, you started out with a very, very basic, the very beginnings of a good reliable recall. Now, obviously, it's not that easy, and it does take a lot of repetitions and a lot of building and building further and further away and then adding distractions and so forth before you'll get a really good off-leash reliable recall. Joe, come! Yay! Who's the good boy coming to me? So what I'm doing here is scratching Joe with one hand by his collar and feeding him a treat with the other one. Very good boy. I'm also telling him how handsome and wonderful he is. And when I'm done, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to ignore him so that Laura can call him. Joe, yes, come. Excellent boy. I want to make sure that I feed him directly in front of me because I don't want him going off to the side. I don't want him running past me. And when he does start to come to me, that's when I'm going to say the word come. I'm not going to wait until he gets all the way to me. And I'm also going to wait until he starts moving before I say come. Joe, Joe, come, Joe, come. Yay, you found me. And what I did here was hide behind the wall a little bit so that Joe had to find me. Hide and seek is a great way to teach your dog to come to you. Joe, come. Yes, excellent, yay. You also want to make sure that when he gets to you that you're really happy and basically you're making a party. It always, always has to be worth it to him to come to you. Joe, Joe, come, yay. I'm also being very careful to keep the treats very close into my body. Don't make the mistake of reaching out for your dog. If you do, you'll get a dog who comes to you and stops a foot or two away. You don't have to make a training session a long, boring ordeal for either you or your dog. Training sessions are actually more effective when they're in very short increments. If you can do three to five minutes five times a day, that would be excellent. If you can only manage three times a day, that's okay too. And that's great because that makes it more fun for the dog. And if it's fun for the dog, he's going to keep playing the game. And when you look at it, that's all it is to the dog is a game. And you want it to be a game. You don't want it to be a chore for him or else he's going to be very reluctant to do it. So remember, training should be a positive experience for both you and your dog, and if you use gentle reward-based methods, it will be.
we're going to be doing here is teaching Bernie how to walk nicely on a loose leash. And the way we're going to do that at first is just to have him sit by my side, and then I'll just take a few steps forward with him at my side, stop, and expect him to sit next to me. So I'm going to give him a warning that I'm taking off by saying, let's go. Good boy. I'm rewarding him for walking nicely by my side. Oops, drop that one. Come on, let's go. Good. And sit. Good. The way we would turn this into a longer walk is just start extending the number of steps you take in between stopping and expecting your dog to sit. Of course, you should practice this with no distractions first. If you have a safe enclosed backyard, you can even practice this off leash. Once your dog really gets the hang of it in your backyard, take some tasty treats with you and start practicing on the street where there's very low distractions and build up from there. This is Noodles and he's our Doberman and we're going to be working on loose leash walking, which is very similar to heel, but it has a little more leeway. Noodles here. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be trying my hardest to keep him in this general area. I have this imaginary square next to me, and as long as he's moving in the square, I'm going to be talking to him, I'm going to be smiling at him, I'm going to be telling him what a good boy he is, and I'm going to be giving him a cookie for staying there. Noodles here. Good. Now, I might have to use a cookie to get him into position at first. Good boy. Here. Good. And once he's in this imaginary square, I'm going to walk. Excellent. Good boy. Good boy. But remember, I'm talking to him. Ah. If he starts to go ahead of me, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to make him get back into position. Excellent boy. And I'm going to make him take a couple steps forward before I give him a cookie again. Very nice. That's very nice. Ah. Come here. Good. Very nice. Over here. Good. Good. Now, I can use a piece of food to get him back into position, but I'm not going to pay him as soon as he gets into position. Here. Come here. Good. I'm going to make him take a couple extra steps. Excellent. And I'm trying to hold the food out of his reach. Good boy. Very nice. Now, you'll notice the leash is very nice and loose. Good. That's why it's called loose leash walking. Now, I don't want to walk and try to force him to stay in position by tightening up on the leash because then he, he's not learning anything. All he's learning is that a walk feels like this, and we want him to learn that a walk feels like this. Also, it's very hard for me to distinguish when he's actually pulling if there's constantly pressure on the leash. So if by keeping the leash loose, I can watch the leash, and as soon as it starts to tighten up, that's when I know that he's going to start to pull. Come over here, sweet. Good. And I'm just going to make him cover the same 20 feet over and over again until he realizes that's excellent, that being next to me is the best place in the world to be. Now, you have to remember that when you're outside, you're competing with the environment. That means that as nice as you are, there's a lot of good sniffs in your neighborhood. There are other dogs and other critters and just everything else out here that he doesn't get to smell that often. So he gets to spend an awful lot of time with you, but once he gets outside, he wants to see everything. So you have to make yourself all that much more exciting so that he pays attention to you. And sometimes that means you have to be very animated and really kind of make a fool out of yourself and make your neighbors think you've gone nuts. But that's okay in the beginning because do we really care what our neighbors think? Nah, our dogs are more important. Come on, sweet. Good boy, Noodles. Hip. What you doing way up there? Did you forget about me? Come over here. That's so good. Look at you. Excellent boy. Excellent. Look at you. That's so good. Excellent. Ah, come here. Look at. Oh, good. Come here. Turn around. Good boy. Very nice. Nope. Get back here. Good. Excellent boy. Very nice. Now I want to make sure that I pay him in position. Here. Good boy. Very nice. Now you might also notice that he's not wearing a collar that could hurt him or damage him in any way. He's wearing a flat collar. This particular model is called a martingale, and it's a limited, it's a limited type of collar. And basically, since he has a very thick neck and a very thin head, we want this so that it'll tighten up when I put the leash on so it doesn't come off over his head, but it's not going to hurt him in any way. Good boy, Noodles, as you sling slime everywhere. Come here, sweet. Good boy. Good. So I'm just going to remind him that we want him to be in position. And the better at this he gets, the less often I'm going to have to pay him, and the less foolish I'm going to have to look to my neighbors. Once he realizes that I'm just always the best place to hang out, 
Yay, what a good boy. That's a good boy. Come here. Once he realizes that I'm the best place to hang out, he's just going to automatically start hanging here and ignore everything else on the street. So what I'm doing here is waiting until Eddie backs up. Yes. And then I'm giving him the treat. I'm going to try to be careful that I don't say yes when he's pawing at me, because I don't want him to think that's what I'm rewarding him for. Yes, good boy. Excellent. I'm going to try this one a little higher up and see if we can get rid of that paw. Yes, good boy. Excellent. Yes. Very good boy. Very nice. Good. So I'm asking him to do it a little bit longer that time. Now that he's actually doing it, I'm going to add the verbal cue, leave it. Leave it. Yes, good boy. Very nice. Leave it. Very good boy. Now the reason I'm using a little bit of a stern voice here is because I know gosh darn well that if the dog is going for something on your floor, you're not going to be sitting there nicely saying, leave it please. So, leave it. Very good boy. Very nice. Leave it. Good boy. Now we're going to move over to the table, and I'm going to expect that because I've taught him over here. Sit. Good. Now I expect him to leave this. Leave it. I'm telling him as I put it down. Good boy. Yes, take it. Now the reason I'm not letting him take it when I stop is because I don't want your dog taking things off your counter. Leave it. Good boy, take it. Excellent puppy. You've got to be faster than the dog here, so if the dog goes to grab it, you've got to put your hand down over it or pull it away real quick. Now that you're such a store pupil, we're going to tell, <laughs> this is the very hardest one, and now I'm going to expect him to leave something that's on the floor. Now this is tough for most dogs, so don't go too far too fast. Leave it. Good boy. And take it. Again, not pushing him too far too fast, keeping my hand near the treat. Leave it. Good boy. And take it. Very good puppy. Now I'm going to just put this a little closer because I trust you. Leave it. If he lays down, that's okay. Leave it. Good boy, Eddie. And take it. That was excellent. You're the best beagle in the room. Now that we've taught Eddie a few leave it's and I feel he's good enough at it, I'm going to bring out the big guns. Eddie tends to go for shoes that are left on the floor. So I'm going to just drop this. Leave it. Good boy. That was excellent. Leave it. Very good boy. Excellent. The way you want to do this, if your dog really goes for a certain item like shoes or socks, just find something that your dog likes and make sure that the reward is better than the thing that's laying on the floor. Walk by and sort of nonchalantly drop it on the floor. As your dog goes over to it, as he approaches, but before he gets his mouth on it, say, leave it in the same voice that you've been using for training. Then reward him with a treat out of your hand. Sit. Good boy. Leave it. Leave it. And take it. Very nice. You notice that I'm keeping my hand very close by, just in case he decides to go for it. You've got to be faster than the dog. Leave it. Good boy. Take it. Excellent puppy. You're so smart. Leave it. Very good boy. Now, the reason that I'm also giving it to him rather than letting him grab it is because I don't want your dog to ever think that they can grab food off the counters, or anywhere for that matter. Since he's doing so well, we're going to start doing this a little bit tougher for you here. Palo, leave it, and we're going to put it right on the floor. Good boy, take it. Very good boy. Sit. Leave it. Leave it. Not taking my hand too far away, just in case I need to grab it. Good boy, take it. Now, if it's easier for you and you'd like to, 
You can also cover the item with your foot. Come here. Sit. Good boy. Leave it. Good boy. It would be tough for me to get that before he did. Ah. Although I can be very tricky and fast. Leave it. Leave it. Much better, boy. Take it. Yay. Excellent. OK. Hey, this is Buddy, and he's a boxer mix, and we're going to be working on give. Give is different than leave it in that the dog will already have something in his mouth and you want to take it from him versus leave it means just don't even touch it. So the way we start this out is we start with a low value item, we put it down next to the dog and all we're doing is saying give, picking up the item, giving him a cookie for it, good boy, and then giving him the item back. To him this is the most stupid thing in the world but what we're doing is we're setting up a reward history so that we're teaching him that I'm gonna say give take something from him, give him a cookie, and give him the item back. And there's no way that he can lose in this game. Yeah? Buddy, sweet pea. I know, lie down. Thank you very much. Now, we can move to a higher value item. He's going to chew on it. Look at this. Look at this. There's nothing in that hand. And he thinks I still have a cookie in this hand. You want to take that? Good for you. Good boy. So he's chewing on it, and then I'm going to say give. And I'm going to show him that I have a treat in the other hand and move it to the side so that he has to let go of the stick in order to get the treat. Good boy. Now, I'm not going to let go because possession is nine-tenths of the law, even in the dog world. Huh? Yeah. Good. You want to take it? And he's already anticipating that I'm going to say give. So I'm going to actually go ahead, because I trust him, I'm going to go ahead and let him take it. And I like the fact that he's not running away from me with it because that means that he trusts me. And I'm going to pet him and tell him that he's a good boy. Good boy. Good. Give. And I'm going to reach in and grab onto it. I'm going to show him the cookie. And as soon as he lets go, I'm going to, I'm going to give him the cookie. Good. And I'm going to hand it to him again. Good boy, bud. Good boy, buddy. And then I'm going to say give. And he doesn't quite have it yet, so I'm going to reach in and take this. Did you see how he let go of the stick as soon as my hand started to come in? That's a lot nicer than the dog who will hover over the toy or turn their head away to prevent you from taking it. Take it. Good for you. Good boy. Good. Give. Very nice. And that was perfect. We want him to spit it out either on the floor or in your hand when you say give. Take it. Good boy. Good boy. Give. Excellent. And I want to make sure that I reach in and take it before I give him the cookie. As long as I know I can get away with it. Good. Take it. Very nice. Good boy. And I'm going to let him chew on it for a few more minutes or a few more seconds. Good boy. Very nice. Give. Very good boy. And if you have a dog that likes to guard things a lot and is more likely to either run off with it or turn his head away from you or even growl, number one, you don't want to correct him for the growling. You can't say, no, don't growl, because what that does is it gets rid of the warning sign, and that's where you end up with a dog who bites without warning because you've basically told him, don't warn me. And you also want to make sure that you don't jump to a very high value item very quickly. If you have a dog that guards things a lot, you want to make sure that you do a lot of repetitions with a low value item. Remember, if your dog has a serious guarding issue where he's growling or snapping, you need to contact a professional to help you with this problem. <coughs> what we're doing here is teaching Anza good wait to wait for the food dish to be put down. Wait, wait, all right, very good, very nice. Let's try that again. Okay, Anza, Anza, wait, wait, good, wait, very good, wait, wait, all right, yay. 
If your dog doesn't do this on the first try, which is more the norm, what you're going to do is, as you bend down with the food, if your dog breaks the stay, you're going to just simply straighten up and wait. Have patience, put your dog back in the stay position. It look like stay, wait, start going down. It'll take a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, but your dog really will get this. Just be sure that you're faster than your dog is. The last thing you want to happen is for you to put the bowl down, stand up, and your dog runs and grabs the bowl. So be sure you're down there the first couple times so you can pick it up very quickly if you have to. Your dog will get this in no time at all. This is a really nice thing to do at every feeding time. It helps to establish your leadership, and it's a good impulse control exercise for your dog as well. Oh, that spoon didn't taste very good, did it? I bet the next time you won't bite down quite as hard. Oh, very nice. Already he's taking it more gently than before. Gentle. Good. So now I'm starting to add the word gentle in. And I'm going to start putting my hand right here as well. Gentle. Oh, much nicer. His mouth is really softening up here. Gentle. Good. Now I'm going to start moving my hand a little bit off the spoon. Gentle. Very nice. This is the same dog who was making my fingers bleed just a few minutes ago. Gentle. Very good boy. And now because he's doing so well, I'm going to take the spoon away altogether. Gentle. Oh, much nicer. With a little practice, he'll be taking treats this way all the time. Very good boy. Yukon, and we're going to be teaching her how to respond to her name. Now, she probably already knows that her name applies to her, but she doesn't know how to correctly respond to it. Ideally, you want your dog, when they hear their name, to look at you and say, yes, ma'am, what do you want? Or, yes, sir, what do you want? And that's how we know that they've heard their name and that they're actually paying attention to us. Sit. Good. So the way we do that is I'm going to do something to get her to look away from me, and then I'm going to call her name one time because I would like for her to respond to her name the first time every time, and then I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get her to look me in the face. As soon as she does, I'm going to use a clicker. It's an event marker, and basically it tells her that what she's doing is correct. And I have her on the leash to keep her from walking away from me, you know, hearing other things in the house and getting bored. So my job is to keep her interested in hot dogs health. Good. Ready? So I'm going to hold the hot dog out to the side. Yukon, sit. Good. Sit. Good. I'm going to hold the hot dog out to the side and say, Yukon. Excellent. As soon as she looks at my face, I'm going to click. Because I know that as soon as I start moving my hand with the hot dog towards her, that she's going to start watching my hand. And I don't want her to think that she's getting paid for watching my hand. I want the clicker to tell her she's getting paid for what she was doing at the time she heard the click. Yukon. Excellent. That was very good. And these hot dogs are a little bit slimy and slippery. Sit. Good. Yukon. Oh, that was perfect. Very nice. Yukon. Good. I didn't click her the first time because she wasn't quite looking at my face. Good. She was trying to cheat and look halfway between my face and the hand with the food. Sweetie, come over here. Good girl, sit. Excellent, good. Yukon, good. And because she's not looking at me now, I don't have to hold the food out to get her to look away from me to do this exercise. I can just say her name, Yukon. Good girl, very nice. So I can just wait for her to look away from me. Yukon. Hey. Now, this is a very good example of what you can do if you're having a hard time getting the dog to look at you. You can say their name, show them the food, and then hold the food up between your eyes. Okay. And she's losing track of it. Excellent. And then I'll click when she follows the food up to my face. So that's another thing you can do if the dog isn't responding to any of your verbal sounds. Good girl.
we're doing here is teaching Kobe to target the back of my hand with his nose. That means touching his nose to it. Good boy. Every time his nose touches my hand, I'm going to click. And of course, every click is followed by a treat. The click tells him the exact moment that he touched my hand was exactly what I wanted him to do. Very good boy. Excellent. Now, I haven't said the word touch yet because I'm not convinced that he's going to do it every time, but he's getting pretty good at this. Very good boy. So let's take a chance and we'll say touch. Very good. Until you're about 80% sure that your dog is actually going to do it when you ask him to, don't add the cue word touch in. Now, you might wonder what you can use this for in real life. Well, one thing is you can certainly turn this into, uh uh, stay. You can turn this into touch. Good. Getting your dog to walk nicely next to you, like this. Touch. Very good. Touch. Kobe, touch. Good. Excellent. Touch. Good. And here I have a dog who's off leash who's doing almost a perfect heel. Sit. Very good boy. This is also an excellent exercise to practice at the vet's office or anywhere else your dog might be stressed just to take his mind off things. Touch. Very good boy. Practice with your dog at home. It's really a fun exercise for them. This is Trooper, and he's a cockapoo, a Cocker Spaniel Poodle Mix. And he's a very fearful dog. So what we've done to help him deal with his fears, because really, he doesn't even like to be out of his own house, what we've done is we've taught him a bunch of tricks, and we've also taught him a very simple behavior, which is called touch. And that means that when I hold out my hand, I just want him to touch his nose to my palm. Touch. Good. So when he's acting fearful, all I have to do is hold out my hand, say touch. And now you're doing your foot touch. Good for you. And that swaps him from fear mode into play mode. And that way I'm not just putting food in his mouth for being afraid. I'm getting him to do something else that I can reward him for. Touch. Good. And I can put my hand as close to him as possible. Touch. Touch, sweetheart. Touch. Good. And that way, all he has to do to succeed is turn his head and touch my palm. Good. Give me your foot. Can I have your foot? Troop. Yes. Excellent boy. Because the more behaviors a fearful dog has to deal with life, the easier it's going to be for them. And you can see the enthusiasm he has in doing this behavior. Touch. Good. Very nice. That's excellent. <laughs> She's a Jack Russell Terrier, and we're going to demonstrate through a combination of luring and shaping how to get her to go to her bed. Ready? I'm going to start out by throwing a piece of food over to the bed. Good. Good. Get it. Good. Now, she saw the food go over there and she was sniffing around, but she didn't find it. I clicked her for looking for the food, and then I tossed a piece of food to her. Now, the clicker is an event marker. All it means is that you're doing the right thing, and I'm going to pay you for that. The idea is to pay her more often for being on the bed than off of the bed so that she gets the idea that, gee, every time I'm on the bed, I get more food. I want to pay her a lot for being on the bed so that she gets the idea that the bed is the place to hang out. Good. Good. So even if I have to use a piece of food to get her over there, I'm still going to click for her going and then pay her for it. Good girl. And that was a big piece for her. You want to make sure that you use small treats because you need to make sure that she can eat them fast enough so that you can continue on training. Down. Excellent. Now, once the dog realizes that sitting on the bed is the place to be, then they're going to start hanging out on the bed and wondering why you're not paying them. And that means that they're going to start going through some behaviors that they already know. Like she's in a sit, but she's kind of in a down, and she's not exactly sure what I want. But she is on the bed, and that's what I want. If she knows a down, I can say down, down, hands it down. Good. Very nice. So since she's just learning a down, I have to lean into her to get her to lie down, and then I click her, and then I pay her for being in the down. Good girl. If I pay her a lot for being in the down on the bed, then that's the behavior she's going to offer first, like she just did. That's the behavior she's going to offer first when she gets to the bed. Now, in order to put a word to this behavior, Ansica, what I'm going to do, since I'm sure that I can get her to go to the bed, I want to say, go to your place. Good. Very nice. And I said that because I knew that she was going to head over there anyway. 
I saw that she was drifting in that direction, so I said, go to your place, knowing full well that's where she was headed. So I just took advantage of an obvious situation. Excellent. All right. When I call her off of the bed, I'm not going to pay her. Go to bed. And it would help if I said, go to bed or go to your place. And I were at least a little bit consistent with my, with my cue. I'm going to write it again. So I have the food here. And what she's doing is she's going, okay, I know you have food. How do I get it? And she's thinking, and she's thinking, and she's thinking. And she's thinking, and she's going to get it in. Yes, very nice. And it's really a lot of fun when you do this and you can see the wheels turning in the dog's head. Now, she's thinking about coming to me because she knows I have the food, but she also knows that she hasn't gotten any food for coming to me. So we're going to wait a second. Go to your bed. Very nice. Paula. Hi, sweet pea. Okay, this is Apollo, and he's our golden retriever puppy, and we're going to start introducing him to the crate. And what I want to do is I want to make the crate very exciting. So I want to put a line of treats going from the entrance all the way to the back. And then he's just going to go in and eat little pieces. And as he's going in to get the treats, I'm going to tell him what a good boy he is. I only want to praise him for going into the crate. Excellent boy. And he's hesitating a little bit. He's sort of stretching because he's afraid I'm going to shove him in and close the door on him. Apollo. Here, sweet. Good. Another thing we can do, in addition to treats, is if he likes a toy, we can put a toy in the back of the crate. And he's going to walk around the crate a little bit trying to figure out how he can get the stuff out without actually going in the door. Good. Go get it. Good boy. Now, I'm saying good boy for him just looking into the crate because I'd rather have him looking into the crate than looking at me. Good. Now, I don't want to rush him because the crate is supposed to be a happy place. Good boy. Oops. If you have a crate and you have his food bowl, what you can do is put his food bowl full of his entire meal in the back of the crate, leave the door open or take the door off completely, and just wait. You just wait for him to go inside. And if he's hungry, he's going to go inside the crate and eat all of his food. And when he's in there, you can say good boy, but you want to make sure in the beginning that you don't close the door behind him because we don't want him to think that every time he goes in, you're just going to slam the door shut and keep him in there forever. I love that. Good. Well, when I'm throwing the food in, I want to make sure that when I throw it to the back, that it hits the back wall so that he can hear it. Good boy. So you just have to wait him out. And again, if he's hungry, he's just going to go in. And this is Anza, our little Jack Russell Terrier. And she's so food motivated that she's going to go right in, I'm sure. So we're going to try it once. Good, here. Now, since I'm pretty sure she's going to go in, I'm actually positive she's going to go in, what I'm going to say is I'm going to tell her to get inside. So I'm going to say, inside. And I'm going to toss the cookie inside, and she's going to go inside. Now, since she seems to be fairly comfortable inside the crate, I'm going to go ahead and close the door and feed her through the door. Good girl. Good girl, so that everything fabulous happens inside the crate. I don't want to leave her in here for five minutes at a time and make her panic. I just want to make everything good. Excellent girl. Very nice. And then I'm going to open it up and let her out, but I'm not going to give her any cookies or praise her for coming out. Anza, here. Anza, here. Get inside. Good. Good girl, very nice. And I want to wait longer and longer between each treat so that she's not just standing there because I'm throwing the treats. Good girl, very good. And I'm going to close the door. Good. All right, all right. And see, now she doesn't want to come out. Good, very nice. Part of setting dogs up to succeed is managing the environment so that your dog does do the right thing and there's less chance of them doing the wrong thing. For example, when you're housebreaking your dog, management would include possibly crate training or confining him to one area. If you let him just run loose, of course he's going to have accidents and that won't be the dog's fault. So set him up to succeed by using good management and then reward him for doing the right thing. And this is Anza and we're going to be talking about using exercise pen for house training. Now this is for dogs who are basically latchkey dogs. 
it's for people who work for long hours and the dog isn't going to be able to get out to go to the bathroom. We don't want to keep them in a crate for a long period of time. The way the setup works is that we keep the front of the exercise pen without anything here because that's where the dog is going to be coming when you come home from work or when you come into the room. So we don't want the newspaper up here. It's very important that they have a separate area for going to the bathroom versus spending their time for eating and playing. What I just gave her was called a Kong toy, and there's food inside, and you can also put peanut butter or cheese Whiz or any other type of food to keep her busy during the day. It's also important that she have a bowl of water because puppies need fresh water, and then also her toys. You have to keep her busy during the day, and that's, that's the main part of it. And then the crate needs to be in here too, either a crate or a bed. Now with a very agile dog like this, you're going to have to be careful that she can't jump on top of the crate and then figure out how to pop herself over. And if you do something like this, you can put her kibble in here, you can do other things, and that way she's keeping herself busy and out of trouble. What we've got here is a little setup for housebreaking. Daisy, who's agreed to be our doggy model, and who you might be able to tell has just had some peanut butter, is modeling our in-home doggy setup. Now the reason for this setup would be, if you are working like most people, a full-time job, and you're gone eight to 10 hours a day, you don't want to keep your dog in a small crate. Hi Dees, would you like another lick? Um, crate training is a wonderful thing, and it does use the dog's natural instinct not to soil in their own little area, but you really don't want your dog to be crated more than three to four hours a day, unless it's overnight and they're right near your bed and you can tell that they need to go out. In this circumstance, what we've done is we've put a baby gate across the kitchen here, We've put Daisy's bedding right near the front because we know that she's probably going to hang out up here because she wants to see when you're coming home. What we've done also is we've put a little bit of newspaper way at the back at the opposite end from where her bedding is. Again, we're making use of the fact that a dog's natural instinct is not to soil in their own little area. So we know she's going to be inclined to do it as far away at, from her bedding as possible. Now what I've got here and what's fascinating Daisy so much is called a Kong toy. A Kong has a small hole at one end and a large hole at the other. And the magical thing about Kongs is that you stuff them. The dog then gets to spend all his time excavating whatever you've put in here. Here, gaze. In this case, we've put a little bit of peanut butter in the Kong, and we've put a couple of little hot dogs in there too. And Daisy's going to spend probably a good hour trying to get that stuff out. Now, you can put lots of different things in a Kong. The, the trick is you don't want to use things that are going to fall right out. In other words, you wouldn't want to stuff the Kong full of your dog's dry kibble. If you do want to feed the dog's meal in the Kong, however, use your dog's dry food and also add a little bit of wet food so that it makes like a mortar and it'll keep the food in there and it'll take the dog a while to get it out. Other things you can use as mortar for a Kong are peanut butter, as we're doing here. Cream cheese is another favorite. I even know some people who use that canned cheese, spray that inside, and use that as mortar. You can use dog cookies, treats, anything that is safe for your dog. And now our adorable model Daisy has agreed to help us explain about the have -a ball And what you do with this is put the dog's kibble inside this, their dry food. Yeah, it's your kibble. You then let them knock it around and the kibble falls out this hole. Want to demonstrate? What's that? Oh! Okay, so what's going to happen is this is going to provide mental stimulation and enrichment for Daisy. And instead of just feeding her meal, and if you think about it, dogs are descended from wolves who really had to work hard for their food. They were successful 10% of the time that they hunt, and here we come thousands of years later going, it's your kibble. Okay, we don't want to make it that easy for them. So the have a ball is a nice way to let your dog work for their food. There's another one that's very similar, which is called a molecule ball. The idea behind all of these is that your dog gets mental stimulation. It's enriching for your dog. Think of a dog who's alone all day. They don't have very much to do besides nap, right? So we want to give her something to entertain herself with. You can stuff her meal inside something like the Kong, or you can put just dry food inside one of these types of toys. There are lots of variations on interactive food toys, and a lot of them are meant for just dry food, as opposed to the Kong, which you can put peanut butter and other things in. So don't make your dog's mealtime boring. Let them work for their food a little bit. And on that subject, by the way, another neat thing you can do is what we call the kibble toss. For the kibble toss, what you want to do is measure the dog's food out. You've got it in your hands, and you toss it. You can do this out in your backyard. You can do it in your living room, for that matter. And it really engages the dog's scenting, tracking abilities, and hunting abilities.
This is Anza, and we're going to be teaching her how to ring a bell to go outside to go to the bathroom. And the way we're going to do this is I have a bell hanging on the door at about nose level. No, I really don't care if she rings it with her feet or her nose, but what I'm going to do is because she's so food motivated, I'm going to open the door and show her that I'm putting a piece of food out here. Good girl. You want that? And that one missed. Good. There it is. You're going to get it? There it is. I'm going to tease her a little bit and let her really know that it's out there. You want that? Good girl. Then I'm going to close the door. Not on her. <laughs> Not on her. Come on, sweetie. you got to cooperate. Close the door. And she's going to mess around by the door trying to figure out how to get out. Good girl. I'm going to click as soon as she rings the bell, open the door, and let her go out to get the food. Good girl. All right. All right. Come on. Come on. And she knows there's another piece out there that's just hiding from her. So once she can do this and she goes to the door and she starts ringing the bell, good girl, good girl. Then I'm going to open the door for her and then I'm going to toss the food out. Now the way that you associate this with going out to go to the bathroom, all right, sweetie, you're going to bring her in, come on, you're going to bring her in to the door first thing in the morning when you know that she's going to have to go to the bathroom. You're going to walk her to the door. Of course, you're going to have her on the leash to prevent her from getting bored or getting confused and racing around the house and ending up having an accident someplace else. So you want to bring her up to the door and stand her here. And she's going to stand here staring at the door, staring at the door, staring at the door, and then staring at you like, hello, did you not notice that I have to go to the bathroom? And as soon as she looks at you, you can say, good girl, and you encourage her to go to the door. And pretty soon she's going to, out of just sheer frustration, mess with the bell on the door. And as soon as she does, you can click, open the door, and toss the food outside. And then, of course, go with her to go to the bathroom and pay her again for that. Now, she's ringing it on her own. Good girl. Because she knows now that ringing the bell makes the door open. And that's all we need to teach her. When she goes to the door and she wants it open because she does have to go outside, that that's all she's going to do. Good girl. Very nice. Excellent. Do it again. Good girl. All right. Good. I don't want to pay her on this side of the door for ringing the bell. Sit down. Sit down. Excellent. Good girl. Come on. Good. That was a good one. Now, let's talk a little bit about housebreaking. First thing in the morning, regardless of where your dog is sleeping, you want to make sure that you take them out to the appropriate spot to do their business, because you know darn well they're going to have to go. If you want your dog to go in a certain spot in your yard, put the leash on the dog, walk the dog to the spot, and wait until they go. One thing that's really helpful, whether you have your dog going in a specific spot or not, is to use a verbal cue, which tells the dog you'd like them to go potty. The way I teach this is, and you can use whatever cue you like, at my house it's go potty. Um, the way you want to teach that is, wait until the dog is actually circling and sniffing, or at least has that little gleam in its eye that tells you, I really have to go. When you see that happening, that's when you want to very calmly encourage, go potty, go potty. Because the trick here is, the dog's already thinking about going. And so you're just helping that dog learn by associating hearing that phrase while they're thinking about it and they will eventually go on cue. I can take my dogs to this day, and my dogs are nine years old now, I can take them anywhere with me, say to them, go potty, they'll run out and do their business. Now imagine how helpful that is if you travel with your dogs, or if you need to take your dogs outside on a rainy day and you don't want to stand out there with them forever. So, first thing in the morning, we take our dogs out, we've attached a verbal cue, we say go potty, they go in their spot, you tell them, good dog, lots of praise. It's not necessary to reward your dog with a treat for pottying, but if you decide you'd like to, make sure you give the treat right then and there. What people do is run back in the house with the dog and give a treat. You don't want to do that because dogs learn by association, remember, and you want to associate the reward as closely with the behavior as possible. So again, we take the dog out, go potty. Oh, good dog! And if you want to, then you say, here's a treat. Other times you want to make sure you take your dogs out to potty are after they've been napping, after they've been playing, because play is very stimulating to dogs. And if you have a very young puppy, you'll want to take them out every hour on the hour just to see if they have to go. If you follow these simple rules, it makes housebreaking really easy. Now, to get your dog to understand that it's not okay to go inside the house, 
Number one, you've got to be supervising the dog. Supervising means that you are actually literally watching that dog every second. Because if you don't, the dog is likely to go out into another room and do their business or to just dart behind furniture. A couple of ways that you can keep your dog with you are either tether him to you by clipping his leash to your belt loop or tether him to a piece of furniture. Don't tether him and leave the room. Hang out with him. But you do understand that this means the dog does not have much of an area. And again, dogs won't soil in their own little area, so you know that he's not going to go. What generally happens is that dogs learn not that it's not okay to go in the house, but that it's not okay to go in the house in front of us because we don't like it very much. So what to do if you do find your dog having an accident and he's in the act, you absolutely want to startle him out of it. And the ways you can do that are a sharp hand clap, which I'm not going to do. I don't want to startle Daisy here. Or an eh eh, which would sound a lot sharper and louder were I really correcting the dog. Okay? So we want to startle them out of it, and then we want to hustle them out to the area where they're really meant to do their business. If they then do their business out there, that's great. They've done it again, so praise them anyway, even though you had to startle them to get them to do that. They may not do it outside because you've startled them, and hey, it's a little traumatic for some dogs. That's okay, not a problem. The only time that rolled up newspaper should ever come into play is you roll it up real tight and you say, I should have been watching my dog. It's for you, not the dog. Not the dog's fault if he has an accident. If the dog does have an accident on carpeting, you want to be sure to use an enzymatic cleaner that gets all the way down to the padding and really takes the scent out. Dogs have a very good sense of smell, and if you don't clean it up really well, they're going to go in the same place over and over again. Kind of a neat trick is, if you're not sure where the dog might have gone, take a black light, turn out all the lights, turn on the black light, and you will see every spot in, the, in that carpet. It's actually kind of scary, but you will know everywhere that the dog's gone. So remember, housebreaking is really a team effort between you and your dog. This is Klondike. Like so many other dogs, Klondike thinks that an open door means there's something wonderful on the other side and he wants to dart through as fast as he can to get there. Unfortunately, that is not what we want. So we're going to teach Klondike that when a door is open, it means he has to sit and wait until we tell him it's okay to come through. It's very important to teach your dog this because you don't want any accidents happening when you open a door. Ready? We're going to come over here. Come here. Very good boy. Very good boy. And sit. I'm going to start him off in a sit. And I've got a leash on him just for safety purposes while we practice this. Now, the exercise is I reach to open the door. If his rear leaves the floor at any time, I'm quickly going to just close the door and straighten up and wait for him to sit again. If you have to tell your dog to sit again, that's OK, too. Good boy. Now, if he breaks the stay at any time during this, what I'm going to do is body block him. That means I'm going to step in front of him. And I'm doing this because it's not convenient for me to close the door at this point. I'm going to step in front of him with my body and at the same time give him a little verbal reprimand, a little eh eh. Very good boy. Klondike is actually pretty good at this. Now, when you start this with your dog, very likely, good boy, very likely it's going to take a few times before your dog actually gets it. That's OK. Hang with it, because this is a really important exercise that could actually save your dog's life. Good boy. I've got the leash very lightly here. I'm not pulling him. Very good boy. And now I'm going to give him a release word, which means it's OK to come through the door to me. All right. Very good boy, Klondike. Well done. Jumping up is one of the most common behavior problems. When your dog jumps on you, he wants one thing, your attention. Attention means looking at the dog, talking to the dog, or interacting with the dog. So the first thing you want to do is, if anybody in your family is rewarding the dog for jumping by saying, oh, what a cute dog, you want them to stop that right away. Again, things that dogs are rewarded for, they're more likely to do those things again. You also don't want to do this. Dog jumps, push. This is a great game for dogs. Wow, they jump and you push. They're never going to stop because, again, they've been rewarded for it. So what can we do? We cannot give the dog what he wants. In other words, we're not going to give him our attention. There's two parts to this exercise. This is the first one. Dog jumps. We're going to turn to the side. We're going to fold our arms. And we're not going to look at the dog. That means you don't say, no, don't jump on me. What you do is stand, ignore him. Now, the dog can do one of two things that's going to then cause you to turn around and very calmly greet him. And this is the second part. One, the dog can sit. Many dogs, if they don't know what else to do, they'll sit. I know I'm a good dog when I sit. 
The other thing the dog can do is just have four paws on the floor. When the dog is either sitting or has four paws on the floor, you're going to very calmly reward him like this. Good dog, very nice. And now we're gonna show you with a very live dog named Sammy. Sammy's a hound mix and he flies through space. That's a much better dog, thank you. Dog jumps, we're going to turn to the side and we're not going to look at the dog. We've got Grover tethered to the couch here with a common leash and the reason we have him tethered is to show you what you can do for when your dog jumps on people at the front door. Good boy. So she did exactly the right thing. Let's try that again. Hi, hi, how are you? Hello, what a cute dog you are. Oh, that's very good. Much that's better, very Grover. very good. This is Gus. Gus is a Lhasa Apso. First thing we want to understand is that nipping is a totally natural behavior for dogs. If your puppy is nipping you, it does not mean that they're mean or that they're aggressive. It's just that they explore the world with their mouths. Yes, thank you very much. One of the things you can do when a puppy nips, oh, and now I've got teeth, is you can let out a yelp. Now, when your dog's on their back, that's one of the times they will want to put their teeth on you. And if you noticed, he took his teeth off me right away because I sounded like a little hurt puppy. Because we don't want to use any kind of physical punishment, what we're going to do is remove something the dog wants. In this case, your presence. Most dogs are pretty bonded with their owners, and if you leave, that is a punishment for your dog. So the sequence would be, the dog nips, I yelp, and then I get up and leave the room. This is the equivalent of giving your dog a timeout. You can always give the dog the timeout alternately by putting the dog into his crate, and crates, by the way, are fine for a dog to have a timeout in if your dog is already familiar with the crate and already enjoys being in there. A timeout should be two to five minutes of the dog being quiet. You then come back and very calmly let them out. Now let me show you an alternate way of stopping nipping. What would be incompatible with nipping? How about licking? As long as you don't mind your dog licking you, you can actually teach your dog to give kisses or lick on cue. The way I would do that is to take just a little bit of peanut butter, and what I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of this, whoa, don't go anywhere, on the back of my hand. Peanut butter perfume, it's lovely. I'm gonna let him lick it. As he starts licking, I'm gonna say, kisses. Good boy, kisses, yes. What'll eventually happen is that you can start yelping when your dog puts his teeth in you, and then saying, kisses. And your dog will have a nice way to stay with you and interact with you instead. We'd like to tell you a little bit about our training philosophy. The most important thing we'd like to get across is that there's no need to use force or coercion when you train your dog. Physical corrections are never necessary. Your dog can learn just fine using reward-based gentle methods. What that means is you set your dog up to succeed by breaking behaviors down into tiny bits that your dog can accomplish and then rewarding them for doing the right thing. Because dogs are more likely to repeat behavior which has been rewarded, your dog is more likely to do what you want him to do. And the opposite of a reward is a consequence. Of course, we're not saying that one of the consequences is that you get angry with your dog or that you punish the dog physically. A punishment can be a non-physical punishment, like a timeout. And a lot of times that works better than a physical punishment. If a dog is coming up to you and barking at you or mouthing you or trying to get your attention, the best consequence for that behavior and the best punishment at that time is a timeout. You can take him and you can put him in his crate, you can take him and you can put him outside, or you can even leave the area. That at that point is going to be the best and most effective thing to do to him. Leadership does not mean that you use brute strength to establish your authority. Leadership should be a quiet authority. Just like in a wolf pack where you have the alpha or top dog, if you think about it, the real alpha in a wolf pack is not the one making the noise and trying to start squabbles. The real alpha is a wise leader who only steps in when they need to, then forgives and moves on. In your pack, you are the alpha. 
One of the best ways to establish that is to get your dog on a leadership program. You want to be a dictator, but you want to be a benevolent dictator because you want your dog to like you. I mean, when you think about it, you are your dog's best friend. And if you are very intimidating and domineering when you're trying to be his best friend, he's really not going to like hanging around you very much. And that's not the relationship you want with your dog. That's true. So what are some ways that we can establish leadership? Well, if you're the leader, number one, you control the resources. If you're a parent, you already know a little bit about that because you control, for let's say a teenager, the allowance, the use of the car, the curfew. Well, it starts out that way anyway. In your pack with your dog, you control resources like food. Food is life and death to a dog. Food shouldn't come from that little round magical thing that's always full. It should come from you, O oh great leader. So what you want to do is feed your dog twice a day. Or if it's a puppy, you may need to feed them three times a day. But you don't want a free feed. You don't want to just leave the food there so it's available all the time. For dogs that really need a leadership program, for the really pushy dogs, I just mean the dogs that are a little bit pushy and trying to be, trying to get what they want. And they think that if they're obnoxious, they can force you to give in before they will. And once you give in, boy, they've got you wrapped around their little finger. Little toe? Which is it? <laughs> anyway. One thing you can do to help with that is you can feed them out of their bowl, but you have control of their bowl. You can put the bowl in your lap or you can put it on the table next to you and you can make them work for one little piece of kibble at a time. You can make them sit and you give them a kibble. You make them down and you give them a kibble and you tell them what a good dog they are. And if they choose to walk away from the bowl, guess what? They must not be very hungry. Another great way to establish leadership is to ask your dog to do something to get the things that he wants. Your dog probably gets lots of rewards that you don't even realize during the day. His food is a reward. Getting the leash put on to go for a walk is a reward. A toss of a ball is a reward. Even if your dog only has the most basic sit command down, that's fine. Ask your dog to sit before you put his food dish down. Ask him to sit before you put the leash on. Ask him to sit before you toss the ball for him. And even when he wants to be pet, if he comes over, sits down, puts his paw on you and gives you those big brown eyes, if he's already sitting and he knows it down, ask him to lay down first and then pet him. You can also make him sit before he has to go out to go to the bathroom. Yes, you can. Because that's a necessity and he wants you to do it. So when your dog is standing at the back door barking and saying, hey, you, with the two legs and the opposable thumbs, get over here and open the door for me. You can go over to him and say, oh, gee, I'm sorry, did you want to go outside? And he's going to look at you and go, well, yeah. And when he does, you can ask him to sit. He sits and then you open the door. And he just did something for you. And that makes you the pack leader. Exactly. Remember, you should have more influence over your dog than your dog has over you. And you'll get that by establishing leadership. We'd like to talk to you a little bit about a nice method for training your dog that involves the use of a clicker. This is a clicker, and all it is is a small plastic device with a piece of metal in the middle, similar to the tin crickets that were out when we were kids. Now, why do we use a clicker? The clicker is a marker, and what that means is it marks the exact second that your dog is doing the behavior that you want him to do. Why would a dog care about you clicking? Because every time you click, you're going to follow that click up with a treat. Just because you're clicker training, it doesn't mean you have to have the clicker with you at all times. We use the clicker to train a new behavior, then we name the behavior, in other words, attach a verbal cue to it, and after your dog knows it and is comfortable doing it, you don't need to use the clicker anymore for that behavior. The one thing that's really nice about the clicker is that the clicker overcomes any other ambient sound. So no matter what else is going on, if your dog does something you like and you click the clicker, he is going to come to you for a treat and that's a wonderful thing because although we talk to our dog all the time and we tell the dog they're a good dog all the time when we really need that dog's attention and when we really want to tell him yes that was good and that's what I'm going to pay you for the clicker just jumps in there and really does the job. One of the most important things you can teach your dog is a solid reliable recall. A recall simply means you call your dog to you and they actually show up. So let's talk about the ground rules for how to establish that. One thing is don't call your dog to you for things that your dog is not going to like. Things your dog is not going to like can include any kind of grooming or bathing or something as subtle as when you're leaving to go to work for the day, putting the dog in a contained area. Lots of people don't realize that. They call the dog to them, the dog comes, and what do they get for their trouble? They get stuck in a pen all day. 
or in the laundry room or they call the dog to them and they get the dog happy and excited because they're going, oh, be a good dog, be a good dog, what a good dog you are, have a good day, and then they leave and the dog is all stressed out and you've just called them to you and then you turn around and basically you're leaving them after they came to you and that's really not very pleasant for them. Right, so don't call the dog to you for things the dog is not going to like. Do call the dog to you for things that the dog is going to find rewarding. If you think about it, during your dog's day, he's getting rewards anyway. What about when you start getting that bag of kibble out? You know your dog comes running because he's been operantly conditioned. He hears the food bag rattle and he comes running. So why not say to him, Buster, come, then rattle the food bag. Guess what? If you do that before the things that Buster likes, if you rattle the leash and say, Buster, come, then jingle the leash, eventually what will happen is Buster will start anticipating that when you say, Buster, come, something wonderful is next going to happen. Just like the cat and the can opener. The cat and the can opener? Yes. Every time you open a can of cat food with the electric can opener, boy, those cats come running. Oh. Uh, you're allergic to cats, so you wouldn't know that. <laughs> no cats at my house. <laughs> but it is operant conditioning, and it does actually work on all species. Remember not to call your dog to you during this training process if you are not really sure your dog is going to come when you do. If you use that special recall word, you say, Buster, come, and Buster doesn't come to you, Buster's learning he doesn't have to come when you call. Think about it every time you call him and he successfully comes as a little deposit into the bank of the good, solid, reliable recall. Every time you call him and he doesn't come, that's like a withdrawal. And think of it this way. If you're not sure Buster's out there in the yard, you're not sure whether he's going to come to you when you call him, I want you to think, would I bet Nicole 50 bucks that he's going to come when I call? <laughs> if the answer is no, don't call him. Because she'll be knocking at your door. I can guarantee it. She'll be there with her hand out going, 50 bucks, baby, right here. I'll be right showing here. up. Yep. So. But that's a very good point. Where when she said, Buster, come, one thing you want to make sure of is that you do use the dog's name in a pleasant way. You don't ever, ever want to use your dog's name to get him in trouble. You don't want to say, no, Buster, bad dog. Because as we learned in teaching the dog how to respond to his name, his name means to look at you for further instruction. So chances are, by the time you say his name and he responds to you and the word no or bad dog comes out of your mouth, basically you're punishing him for responding to his name and we don't want to do that. Lots of people say, my dog doesn't listen to me when I'm out in the park. Well, there's a lot of distractions out in the park. You've got to get your dog to listen to you first in the living room before you can expect him to listen to you in the park off leash with lots of dogs around. So what we're saying is it's worth the time and effort to put in to train a really good, solid, reliable recall for your dog. It might save your dog's life one day. And remember, the safest place for your dog is within a three-foot radius of you. So if everything good happens in that little space, that's where your dog is going to be if he gets hurt or in trouble. It's important for your dog to have lots of different types of toys to play with. We're going to show you a couple of different types. One is a squeaky toy. Now this is a squeaky toy that has a little sheepskin coating on it. And for really tough chewers, you might want to monitor them because you don't want to have them, number one, tear up the toy and ingest pieces of it. And you especially don't want to give a dog who's going to be a harsh chewer anything with a squeaky toy because they can actually swallow the small piece inside. This would be good for a really young puppy, though. Right? And it's not a bad idea for you to actually bring out the toy and play with the dog with the toy because that way you are the source of all things fun. You can also, instead of, you know, like with a child, how they get bored of their toys really quickly? With a dog, it's the same thing. If you give your dog 20 toys and leave them strewn around the house all the time. They're going to go looking for the shoe. Yes, exactly, because your shoe is so much more <laughs> exciting. So you want to just rotate their toys, give them three or four toys, that's okay. Then take one back or take two back and give them something different. Keep them interested. Yeah. And if you have a dog that, that isn't interested in toys or that you think isn't interested in toys, the best way to get him interested in a toy, let's say I come home from the store and I have this toy. As soon as you tell him he can't have it, that's what he's going to want. Exactly. That's true. Right. Dogs so, are like kids. So as soon way. as he comes up and he wants to see it, you turn your back, oh no, you can't see it, oh no, it's mine. And you, you keep playing with it, oh no, no, it's mine, because he's going to come around the other side, and then he's going to, and oh, 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 and then you open the drawer and you put it in the drawer and you turn around and walk away like, what toy? I never saw a toy. And you do that a couple times a day for a week, and that dog, you pull that toy out and you drop it on the ground, and the first thing that dog is going to want, because you've been telling him for a week, no, you can't have it. Of course, that's the first thing he's going to go for. That's very true. So if your dog is one of those that you think just doesn't like toys, really try that out, because it totally works. Another type of toy that's fun is a tug toy. Now, you, <laughs> tug toys come in lots of different colors and different lengths and different textures. 
Um, you might have heard that it's not a good idea to play tug with your dog because, oh, it'll make them aggressive and so forth. It's not true. However, tug should have rules to it. Now, we've taught your dog in another section how to do the leave it. Once your dog knows leave it, tug can be a great game. The rules are you bring out the tug toy, you initiate the game because you're the leader and all good things come from you. Mm -hmm. You start playing with the dog, get the dog interested in the tug. Here, you want to be the dog? Sure. Get the do <laughs> don't yank it away. Leave it. Uh, get, the get the dog. <laughs> oh, you didn't say Why? take this it. This is not, a rowdy I'm, dog. I'm a good dog. I'm not supposed to grab it until you say take it. Take it. Want to play? Okay. Yes. So you encourage your dog to get into the game. Your dog starts tugging. Then you freeze and you say, leave it. And if you've trained to leave it well enough, your dog will actually drop the toy and may even step back once and sit. Once the dog leaves it, you can say, good dog. And the dog's reward for leaving it is that you say, take it. And you start playing the game again. And you have to make sure that when you're playing tug and you say, leave it, that there's a big change in your facial expressions and your body movement. If you're playing tug with him and you're going, yay, what a good boy, yay, what a good boy, and then you want to stop the game and you say, leave it, your face goes blank, you stop moving, but even though our mouth is saying, leave it, but our body is tugging on the toy, as far as the dog is concerned, we're still playing tug of war. So I have to make sure that not only do I say, leave it, that I also freeze my body and make my face convey to him, it's really not a good idea to continue with this. And most often, they're going to drop the toy. Right. There's a couple different types of tug toys. You've got these types. Um, you've got the ones that are made entirely of rope. And what you can see has happened with this one is that the dogs have actually started to shred the ropes. For that reason, while it's a great tug toy while you're there to play with them, I wouldn't leave this type of toy alone with your dog. They can ingest the string, and there can be problems from that. Right. Now, another rule for tug of war, and a very important rule, is because we covered that you start the game and you stop the game. But if during the game of tug of war, like let's say your dog's, your dog's mouth is slipping and he lets go to re-grab, if he ever accidentally touches your hand, <gasps> The game is over again. You're going to take your toy and go home. He is never, ever to touch your skin. And yes, he can distinguish between your hand and the toy. Absolutely. Other toys that are great for your dog, and we're just going to show you a couple of different things here. We have things that involve balls. We have tennis balls. Mm -hmm. And be careful about using the generic tennis balls. I can tell you that I have a shepherd who is absolutely ball obsessed. A lot of shepherds are, actually. Apparently. Yes. And it's a beautiful thing because we can play lots of games that can do some training along with them, but be careful because if your dog chews incessantly on the tennis ball, the felt actually has something in it that will make your dog's teeth grind down. And I learned that the hard way, so I don't want you to. That's true with a lot of toys, unfortunately. Yeah. So you really have to make sure if you have a really compulsive chewer that you do things that aren't going to damage your dog's teeth. We do have a toy here that's similar to the have a ball and the molecule ball, and it's basically an environmental enrichment toy. It's called a buster cube. And it's just a square of plastic, and it has a hole in the middle that you can change the size of the hole. And you just put his kibble in there, and it has to be dry kibble. Don't soak it first, mm -hmm. for obvious messy reasons. <laughs> You're going to put the kibble in here and shake it around to make sure it gets in every nook and cranny. You're going to put it on the ground. The dog is going to start rolling it with his nose, and the, and the food is going to fall out. Right. Right. So if you have a latchkey dog, and you're going to be leaving in the morning, and the dog is going to be there all day, what you do is you put the dog's breakfast in here, and that's how he gets his breakfast, and it's going to tire him out because we all know a tired dog is a not destructive dog. Right, and this one actually has four chambers inside it so that it really is a little bit more difficult than the other food toys to get stuff out of. Yeah. Just be careful if you've got expensive furniture or anything else that's <laughs> fragile because this is pretty hard. Yes. I have a friend whose pit bull loves to take this and ram it into the wall, thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. Yes. So just be careful and choose your toys appropriately. <laughs> Being that we use food treats in training so often, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the treats that we do use. First of all, don't use big treats that are going to take too long for the dog to chew. And don't use dry treats like dry hard cookies. You want your treats to be approximately pea-sized or a little bit bigger, and you want them to be nice and chewy. Another thing to take into consideration is that you can use your dog's kibble. There's nothing wrong with working your dog for his food and making him think that he's working for treats because that way you're upping the value of his daily meal. Right, and one way you can do that is to actually break your dog's meal into eight or ten separate little meals that you give him throughout the day for training rather than keeping it at one or two meals the way you do now. Mm -hmm. And that makes training more important because he knows that he's working for his meal and not for 
a treat that he may or may not want because, let's see, you know what, I really don't feel like coming to you right now, plus I know that you're going to feed me in 20 minutes anyway, so it's really not worth it. And that's also a good solution for dogs who are overweight and you don't want to give them a lot of extra treats. Right. Now, some of the, our favorite treats for training, uh, there are a lot of different food rolls that look like a sausage when they start out. You slice them and then you dice them up as big or small as you'd like and they come out looking like this. If you're good at it, they come out in perfect little cubes. Actually, the type of stuff that comes in a food roll is also great for stuffing things like Kong toys. You, what you do is you slice it and when you have it in a slice, but before you dice it up, you squeeze the top hole of the Kong, the big hole, so that it elongates. You put one of the slices in, release it, and your dog can't get the treat out very easily. So that keeps them working for a <laughs> You're while. Driving them nuts that way. Make sure also that any treats you use in training, that, well, if you use a lot of them, that you kind of subtract that amount of kibble from their diet because again we don't want the dog getting overweight from training so let's say if I work my dog for 20 minutes today and he ate oh three quarters of a cup of of these right. then I'm going to subtract from his food about a half a cup to three quarters of a cup of kibble right because you don't want your dog getting overweight from food training also it's important to note that you should vary the treats that you use when you're training Absolutely. you can use sort of low value treats when you're in the house and there's no distractions. Dried Cheerios would be an example of a low value mm -hmm. treat. But when you're outside doing loose leash walking and you've got distractions, other dogs in the environment and so forth, you might want to have something else. Some examples of high value treats might be a hot dog that you slice up and you can even put them in the microwave for about 30 seconds so they're not quite so greasy or string cheese or any other type of cheese that your dog likes that you cut up into little penny sized slices. And that's a really good point because if you're in the house and you're using what we would consider to be the prime rib of treats then when you go outside you, you have no place to go. Another reason you want to vary your dog's food treats for training is think about this if you got the same present for Christmas every year, how excited would you be when you opened your Christmas present? Not very. If you call your dog to come to you and your dog knows, hey, I'm getting a cube of that food stuff, and, and he likes it well enough, but hey, he's rolling in something really great out in the yard, he's going to think, hmm, food treat, rolling in good stuff in the yard. I think I'll stay here. Yes. If, however, he doesn't know what it is you're going to give him, you're keeping him guessing, and he's more likely to come to you. If you want to increase the value of your presence and of your petting your dog, then you just pair it with food. You just pet your dog and give him a cookie and pet your dog and give him a cookie. Straight classical conditioning. It's going to work. Right, because eventually he'll come to associate the petting with the food, and when you fade the food out of the equation, the petting will have taken on more value. Be kind to your dog, be patient, be consistent, and do pay him for a job well done. After all, you don't want to go to work and not get paid. This is Mel, and he's going to help me demonstrate car safety. The first thing we have is a seatbelt strap, and that's a strap with an adjustable handle and a clip with a swivel on the end. And what we've done is we've run the seatbelt through the handle and clipped it. And Mel, come on, Mel, come on, sweet good boy. He's wearing a seatbelt. And basically what this is is a harness with a padded front, and it goes all the way around his back behind his front legs, and it has a D-ring on it. It's very important for your dog to be restrained while you're driving so that if you ever have to slam on your brakes that he won't become a projectile and either injure himself on the back of your seat or injure you flying over the top of the seat. It's also important that if you're going to roll down the windows at all so that the dog can get some fresh air that he not be sticking his head completely out of the window. As we all know things can come flying up off of the road from the cars in front of us and they've put dings in our car, they could of course do damage to your dog's face or eyes. So you just want to open it enough for them to get some fresh air. What we're going to do is we're going to put him up on the seat and we're going to take the harness with the D-rings and the strap and we're going to clip the strap to both of the D-rings and this way if he turns around there's a swivel on the end of the strap that will allow him to turn around without getting tangled up. And once you get moving he's going to settle in and probably lie down. Sit. Mel, sit. Good boy. Good boy.
Hands up. Stand. Good. Down. Good. Stand. Good. Sit. Sit. Nope, that's a down. Sit. Good. Very good. Good. Down. Good. Sit. Hands up. Down. Good. And very nice. Up. Psst, psst. Down. Sit. Yeah, that was excellent. Very nice. Good. Stand. Yay. Very nice. Sit. Good. 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 Down. Good. A nice fast down. Stand. Yes. That was good. Sit. Very nice. Fabulous. Good. Hey, psst, psst. I know. Lots of good sniffs. Stand. Oh, good. Sit. Good. Very good. Down. Good. Sit. Good. Down. Sit. Oh, cheater. Sit. Down. Sit. Down. Sit. Good. Stand. Good. Down. Back up. Down. Sit. Good for you. Good. Stand. Good. Down. Okay, bow. <laughs> Sit. Stand. Good. Down. Nah. -uh. Good. Sit. Nope. Sit. Cheater. Sit. Good. Stand. Good. Down. Ah. -uh. 